Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecaster here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, August 21, 2019. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. We have a lot to discuss today, even though the market had really a relatively narrow range all day long. We had a gap higher, and the market pretty much stayed where it was most of the day. We had a little bit of an EKG event around the Fed Minute release, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Outside of that, the market didn't do anything. However, there are takeaways from that. The market, at least from where I sit, is trying to tell us something. So we're going to unpack all that today. We're going to unpack everything the market's trying to tell us. And by the way, what it did last night, which is something we discussed, we'll take a look at that as well. We'll look at the S&P E-mini futures contract for that. And then we're going to put all that together because to me, it has some kind of relevancy. Remember, we're trying to decipher what the next highest probability scenario is for the market. Now, we may believe that a month or six weeks from now, the market might be lower. However, the market might be a lot higher in between. So we have to manage that. We have to balance the fact that right now, the market might look like it's doing one thing, and over the long term, it may actually be doing something else. That's how we decipher the shorter term chart all the way out through the longer term charts it applies to intraday trades and it applies to swing trades and positional trades as well what do we have at first blush on the daily chart what we have is a market that basically sat on top of the 20 period moving average does that have a lot of significance not necessarily we're at the 20 period moving average we'll just leave it at that what's above we discussed it the last couple of days What's above is A, the 50 period moving average, and B, we have some important pivot areas. This is the market's way of telling us that this price area, this one, the higher one, the 50 period moving average, it's the market's way of telling us that under normal garden variety market conditions, there should be overhead resistance in that general zone. Let's magnify it a little bit and we go down to an hourly chart and you can see today's activity was very, very narrow. It was a very simple gap higher and the market just ran out of gas. So here's your flagpole if we're talking in terms of bull flag pattern and there's your flag and it's not really waving that much. It's pretty steady. So under normal garden variety market conditions, you're going to get a move higher out of this pattern that takes us where? Right to that pivot, maybe higher, maybe into the hourly chart 200 period moving average. But under normal garden variety market conditions, we're going to see overhead resistance there. But what else is on the docket? What else am I looking at? What other information can we use to our advantage? Couple of things. Let's take, for instance, the fact that the Fed minutes were released this afternoon. Now, the minutes are a bunch of nonsense, but it certainly is or can be an excuse for the market to make a move in one direction or another. So they did the EKG thing back and forth, back and forth. Might as well look at a magnified view of that. So here's a five minute chart. Here's the candle that goes from 2 p.m. in the afternoon to 2.05 in the afternoon. And you can see what happened. The market goes down, the market goes back up. We do they decide on a retest and then we go right back where we were by the end of the day. No magic, no real solid information. It just is what it is. Back to the hourly chart, but it is telling me something. What it's telling me is that obviously they had an opportunity to drop the market. They could have filled the gap. They could have done anything they wanted. They chose not to. That's bullish. They stayed in this very tight bull flag pattern. That's bullish. What else is bullish? How about the S&P E-mini futures contract? Remember that area we discussed last night? It was right down here, wasn't it? So whether it was the breakup candle low or slightly lower, we discussed the fact that the market would generally find support in that area. If it didn't, we knew where the next one was. The market is a stair-stepping mechanism. It takes steps up and takes steps down. Sometimes it jumps over steps. 
Back to the daily chart. Throwing the ball around the horn, you need to stay on your toes. Here's where we need to bring up the redonkulous. What happens in the event? What happens in the event that the market gaps above all that stuff we just discussed? All this stuff up here. What happens if it's a gap and go? Whether it's tomorrow or some other day, what happens if it's a gap and go? And I'll tell you what happens, at least from where I sit, that creates another leg of a short squeeze or panic buying scenario. And that's what takes the market, or in this case, the spider, all the way up to maybe 297, 298, call it 297 and a half just for argument's sake, but somewhere up in that neighborhood, maybe even slightly higher. What would that do? This is a hypothetical, obviously, but it is possible. What would that do? That would suck in more bulls into the market. What do they need to do before they hit the market again? They need to suck in as many bulls as possible. Driving the SPY up to 297, 298, something in that neighborhood, even higher than that, would do exactly that. That would get everybody discussing new highs. That would get everybody discussing the fact that we had the correction, it's over, the Fed saved the day, move on, nothing to see here, let's buy the market, rally on. Now, what's the other side of that? We're back to the hourly chart. The other side of that is you wake up to a gap down. The bull flag pattern doesn't work out and it actually becomes a failure. And just to reiterate, what we would have there is the flagpole the flag going like this, and instead of doing this, what it's meant to do, it actually starts to make a box and heads downward. In technical terms, what we call that is a con job out of today's pattern. So here's what we have to do. We have to look at it as the 80-20 rule, and whatever percentage of the time it is, I'm just using that in generic terms, but the 80-20 rule applies. The majority of the time, this is going to break to the upside. However, we have to be aware, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it goes the other way, and the same energy that would have been released to the upside now ends up getting released in the other direction. Let's take a different viewpoint. Again, moving the ball around the horn. 120-minute chart. Here's yesterday's activity. The market falls. It looks like it wants to fill the gap. It's too easy. We talked about the fact that it was like the gap was sitting there with its hand open. It was just too easy. But was this any different in concept from the bull flag pattern? You have the flagpole here. You have a pullback to test the low of the breakup candle, which it never did, but it went in that direction. And then you had the catapult in the other direction, meaning the northern direction. I like to visualize the charts a lot differently than most other people. Sometimes I'll put up a chart like this on the screen and I'll pan out. I'll kind of make it small or I'll sit back and I'll just stare at it and I'll think about things. What does the chart look like? Is there anything that it looks like that relates to things we know, not market related? And when I see this kind of a setup, I can't help but notice you have this move higher here, and this is kind of like a catapult. It's winding up, it's winding up. Same thing with a slingshot. You're pulling it back, you're pulling it back, and once you let go, it does this. Boom. Doesn't do it all in one shot, but that's the concept. I'm just trying to visualize the market without using the market. What can we relate in everyday life not that we use a catapult in everyday life, but what can we relate to the market and that usually matches up pretty nicely? Again, where does this come from? It comes from common sense market analysis. What's found in the Lazy E-Mini Trader course? Common sense market analysis. By the way, yesterday we mentioned the fact that the Fed could potentially goose the market. I use that term in the title of the video or the cover thing. We discuss the Jackson Hole Wyoming thing. Central bankers are in Jackson Hole on their boondoggle. How would it look if the market fell apart while they're out there? Powell is gonna speak on Friday. Do you think he wants to disappoint the markets or do you think he wants to please the markets? I don't have the answer, but these are the questions we all have to ask ourselves when we put all the stuff into the big bucket 
when we put all the puzzle pieces on the table and begin to assemble the picture. Before we leave the SPY chart, I'll leave you with this. Have they really done anything except go back and forth? That's all they're doing. They're staying in this channel until they don't. Now, we just discussed potentially breaking out of this channel. That doesn't mean the market's going to make new highs. That just means if they break out of this channel, there will be a vacuum to the upside. Intraday breakout, one thing, start closing above those highs we discussed earlier, something entirely different, that brings in the Electrolux. The IWM, my favorite market leading indicator, anything going on here, not really, it was on par pretty much, give or take, with the S&P 500, was up slightly more than the S&P, but in the big scheme of things it doesn't matter, we're headed for the moving averages, can we get above this high here from the 8th, that'll be an interesting question. That high is 152.63. That'll be an interesting one because if we do, we're headed back up into the moving averages toward this downsloping trend line. That's a tall order. It's way too early to talk about that. But if we're getting a vacuum in the other markets, we're going to get a vacuum in the IWM as well. So you need to know both sides. Can it just turn around and collapse? Of course it can. That's the other side. That's the con job of the bull flag pattern that we discussed in the SPY. How about the Silicon Valley folks, the triple Qs? They're in a different position than the IWM, similar position, but yet better than the SPY. So we're sitting on top of the 50 period moving average. Get above the 50 period moving average. Guys, girls, traders, investors, money managers, turn bullish. That's just the way it is. So they're trying to suck everybody back into the bullish side of the market. Will it be successful? How high will they go? Time will tell, but that's what's going on when I view this chart. Same rules apply. You get above this high from the 13th, 189.68. Start closing above there. Even hourly closes above these price levels will be extremely bullish and will likely have some bears running for cover. Pun intended xlf the financials not so impressive not exactly the same look this is not the same chart this is not the same market when i look at this chart this chart is telling me something different than we just discussed from a short-term perspective we can go higher yes but look how far away we are from the moving averages as compared to some of the other charts that we just looked at. So what the financials are telling me is there's more trouble than the stock market may be leading on at present. Even if we go higher tomorrow, Friday, Monday, the financials, until and unless they turn around, until and unless they get above this high here and close above that high at 2731, the high from the 9th of August, then they're in a very, very bearish position. Quite interestingly enough, that price up there is very, very close to our old friend, 2747. It's funny how the market works. There are no accidents. There are no coincidences. Short term, stock market might be bullish. Longer term, the financials are telling a different tale. The SMH, which is a good proxy for the tech sector, it tracks the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. So we're above all the moving averages. Now, technically, this is still a bear flag pattern. It's not really a flag. It's more of a bearish wedge pattern when it goes like this down and we have this wedge here. So this is forming a wedge that will ultimately break to the downside. But you can see the concept is it can certainly go higher. The top line isn't really where it should be. But from a conceptual standpoint, you can see how the market can trade within this wedge back and forth drive traders crazy it's a form of torture until it's ready to break down like this it'll be ready when it's ready what changes that picture well for me at least on the daily chart you have this breakdown candle high here all the way up at 120 so in my mind you really have about five dollars worth of leeway where this thing can run to the upside or in the northern direction before it really takes that bearish wedge scenario off the table new topic throwing the ball around the horn let's talk bonds but we're not really discussing the tlt chart 
I just brought the chart up to kick off the bond discussion. I want to focus the bond discussion a little bit differently. The real discussion in the financial media, the punditry, all this stuff is really with the yield. The 30-year yield, the 10-year yield, the inverted yield curve, the twos and tens. Don't pay any attention to any of that stuff. We're going to solve the riddle right here. Bond yields are going lower. There's two reasons bond yields go lower. The market drives them there, or the Fed wants them to be there, or a combination of both. That's it. Period. Full stop. The flip side of that is the screaming rally we've had in bond prices. But there's a reason why yields are going lower. This goes back to Conspiracy Theory 1.0, Conspiracy Theory 2.0. Maybe this is Conspiracy Theory 3.0. We had 2.5. This may be the same. Frankly, I don't even remember what 2.5 was. Somebody will chime in and tell me what it was. But here's the concept. We've been discussing all along that the Fed and economists were panicked. What are they panicked about? Are they panicked about the banks in Europe? Are they panicked about the trade war? Are they panicked about something else? Are they panicked about General Electric? Well, I don't think the Fed is exactly panicked about GE. However... GE is a big problem. We've discussed GE before. GE will eventually be self-liquidated, meaning they're selling off businesses. They have good businesses. I don't know what's going to be left over. What gets left over is essentially, I guess you could say, will wind up as, quote-unquote, bad debt co. But this is kind of a smidgen of the story. The XRT, I think, is a bigger portion of the story. So this is the exchange-traded fund that tracks the retail sector. Doesn't matter what the leading stocks of this index or sector or this ETF is. The point that I want to make is what's actually happening out there in the bond market. Not the stock market, the bond market. What do you think Macy's debt is trading at? Now here's the way debt works. You're a pension fund, you're a mutual fund that manages bonds. You're an individual investor. Maybe you're a retiree that buys both corporate and or municipal bonds. So bonds are bought by a wide variety of different entities. Par is 100 cents on the dollar. There are exceptions to the rule, but bonds are generally issued at par, 100 cents on the dollar. If somebody was buying 25 bonds, they would pay $25,000 and they would get coupon payments or interest payments. Maybe it's a 5% interest payment, maybe it's 3%, maybe it's 10. Depends on the bond, depends on the maturity, depends on the time you bought the bond and where interest rates were at that point in time. Somebody buying bonds today isn't getting paid anything compared to where they were buying them when interest rates were much higher. But here's the underlying issue. When bonds mature, they mature back to par. There are some exceptions to the rule, but for the purposes of this conversation, they mature back to 100 cents on the dollar or par. As we're having this discussion, we're just looking at a different retailer that's in trouble. We've talked about this before. I think that was 2.5. We talked about the retailers. Well, here we go again, but I'm taking them from a different angle. As bonds get close to maturity, they get close or snuggled up to par. Maybe they're trading slightly over par, maybe they're trading slightly under par, but since they're going to mature and the bond holder is going to get paid back what he put in, the bond holder basically lent the company money in this case, they lent the $25,000 to the company, and at maturity, the company pays back the $25,000 and they've paid interest along the way. It's the same concept when you put money into a bank account. They pay you interest along the way, and you can have your money back anytime you want. It's more akin to a CD. In fact, a CD is a bond. The backer of a CD up to a certain amount is the FDIC or the federal government. The backer of a corporate bond is the corporation. So what happens if the corporation isn't able to pay back the money? Ah, now all of a sudden it starts to make sense. If the corporation isn't able to pay back the money they borrowed from whoever they borrowed it from, the corporation will end up defaulting. The bondholders stand in front of stockholders. 
They'll wipe out the equity before they pay the bondholders. Bondholders typically don't get completely wiped out because in a liquidation sale, the bondholders, along with other senior debt holders, do get paid. Maybe 30 cents on the dollar, maybe less, maybe more. Depends on the company, depends on the situation, depends on the bond. There are different types of bonds. Some are senior to others. Nobody knows this stuff, but that's the reason why these companies are trading lower. If you look at their bonds, and we're not going to do that, do the homework yourself. They're not easy to find, but I know without even looking at them what the bonds look like. When you look at the bonds of a company like Macy's or General Electric or Best Buy or a whole host of other companies, the bonds are trading at a significant discount to par. The discount is representative of the amount of risk you have to take by buying the bond. So for example, a bond that might have originally been issued at a 5% yield at par, if it's trading at a significant discount to par, the risk that you're compensated or the compensation for that risk is the fact that you're getting the same interest payment the person who bought the bond at par gets, only you're paying a discount, so the interest to you has a higher yield. That's the compensation for the risk. Some of the charts we look at, the companies will default. Some of them will not. Some of them will be saved. These companies have value. Some of them have hidden value. But when they have too much debt and they can't service the debt and they can no longer make the payments, meaning they're cash flow negative, it's just like you and I. If we go cash flow negative and we can't make the credit card payments, what happens? We just can't pay the bill. Same thing with a company. Ultimately, the same thing with the 20 some odd trillion dollars of U.S. debt. And there, my friends, is a good place to pull the ripcord for today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. I appreciate you very much. All the subscribers, all the viewers, all the longtime followers, all the new followers. I thank everybody very much. This was another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.